Welcome everyone to the very first Women in Finance event here at the Huntsman School of Business. I am so happy that there are so many of you joining us. This event has been a long time in the making and our hopes is that it will continue each year, especially when we're able to meet together in person to network and learn from each other and the wonderful women in the finance industry. So my name is Charity Parkinson and I will be the moderator for our panel today. Um, I am currently in the Masters of Accounting program at the Huntsman School, which isn't finance, I know, but I see a strong correlation between finance and accounting, and I have come to love the opportunities available in the finance industry. I completed an internship with J.P. Morgan Chase in wealth management in summer of 2020, and I will be returning to J.P. Morgan full-time as an analyst this coming summer. The theme for our Women in Finance event this year is RISE. There are a lot of challenges right now, especially, and we hope that today will give you some courage and some ideas of ways that you can rise to meet those challenges. Before we begin the panel, I just want to take a minute and thank all of those that made this event possible. I would love it if our student leadership team could take a quick minute to just introduce themselves. You can tell us your name, your major, your year in school, and kind of why you're interested in finance. So if it's okay, we'll start with Maya, and then we'll go to Sarah, and then Kaya, and Olivia. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'm Maya Bird. Um, I'm a junior here, and I'm studying finance. Um, something I love about finance is, like, I love that it's just a way to gain really valuable skills and useful knowledge that I feel like many people are lacking in the world. Um, and because of that, I think it's a way that I'll be able to help other people in my career path. So, okay, Sarah, you can go ahead. Sorry, I forgot the order. <laughs> My name is Sarah Wadhams, and I'm a sophomore, and I'm an economics and statistics major. And I'm interested in finance because I think it's one of the best ways to um, to help businesses and individuals to. Uh, to find those opportunities and that growth that they're seeking for. Um, and it just really excites me. Okay, my name's Kaya Nelson. I'm a junior at Utah State. I am doing a triple actually in finance, econ and marketing. Um, and I like finance because um, like with my marketing side, I am like to be creative and think out of the box, but I love finance because it grounds everything in numbers and data and just makes a lot of sense. Hello, um, my name is Olivia Archibald and I'm a first semester junior and I'm majoring in finance with a minor in personal financial planning. Um, I love finance for a lot of different reasons, um, but it's intellectual stimulating, which I really like, um, but it can also be extremely liberating when people know what to do uh, with their money and how to handle it. I think it can really enable them to live their best lives possible. And so that's kind of the route I want to go is just um, helping people find that peace of mind. Um, and I've, I held a variety of different internships. I, it's just recently that I decided to go the financial planning route, um, but I'm excited. I love the finance world and I think it's awesome. So I'm excited to hear from all of you. Awesome, thank you so much. These ladies put in a lot of work to help me get this event off the ground and I really appreciate them. I also want to thank John Ambrose who's helping us out on Zoom today, Paul Felstead, and Nate Jensen, who's the finance career coach, as well as the Women in Business Club. They were kind of our partners with this event and they were so helpful. Leanne Wapit, Carmela Johns, Andrew, and especially Bailey Hawes, who is the WEBA president this year. She put together the lovely t-shirts that we got this year. So we are really appreciative of her, appreciative of her and all of her hard work. And if you haven't picked up your t-shirt, you can. They are in EBB room 309. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our panelists. We have a wonderful group of ladies here to share their knowledge and wisdom with us. And we are so thrilled that they were able to join us. I hope you all got a chance to read through their bios that we sent out to you. If I could just have each of the panelists share a little bit about themselves and their company, that would be great. And we'll start off with Mary from Goldman Sachs. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Mary. I'm at Goldman Sachs. I work in... Um, with companies, it's like it's layer upon layer of team, but I'm in asset management and I work with alternative investment manager selection. And really simply what that is, is 
if you've ever seen Shark Tank, my team's job is to choose the sharks, um, to choose the managers that find the good investments. Um, and this is my dog, Milton. He's a little miniature schnauzer. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Mary and Milton. We're glad that you could join us as well. Um, let's have Maria go next. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Um, oh, okay, good. So uh, yeah, my name is Maria Castro. I am currently living in uh, Zürich in Switzerland and I am a consultant uh, for Ernst & Young. Uh, so I work for the um, risk uh, business consulting risk transformation uh, service line and um, I work in a team that performs financial IT audit uh, and that means that we support the teams that perform the financial um, the financial uh, or sorry the audit for the financial report um, and we provide assurance on the IT information and technology that is actually used uh, to produce those reports. Uh, so that's very interesting. That's, that keeps us busy during the busy season and then during the low time, um, then we, we work on um, uh, reports, at the station reports and assurance reports for organization controls, uh, risk management systems, uh, and so on. And uh, we serve a broad scope of clients. And at the moment, I have in my portfolio uh, financial clients, which, which, which is uh, very interesting, uh, but also like industry clients. Uh, so about me, besides work, uh, I come uh, from the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's been <laughs> a long way to Switzerland. Uh, of course, I attend the youth estate. So I lived in, uh, in, in Logan. Uh, I moved to Salt Lake, where I was also worked for Goldman Sachs for a while. Um, and then I moved to Germany. Uh, I lived in Germany, studied there for two years, and uh, I've been in Switzerland since mid-2017. Uh, so yeah, looking excited to be here and looking forward to, to hear from the rest of the panelists <laughs> as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, let's have Peyton go next. Hi, I'm Peyton Knight and I'm from Farmington, Utah originally. I was in your shoes not too long ago. I graduated from Utah State last May with degrees in finance and economics. And then last June I started with Zions Bank where I'm in the banker development program, which is essentially a 12 to 18 month program to train young professionals in commercial lending or loans to businesses. So I'm really excited to be back with all my fellow Aggies today and thank you for letting me join. Wonderful, and Brooke, let's hear from you. Hi everyone, uh, so I graduated from Utah State at the end of 2019 with a degree in finance and accounting. And last August, I started working for Partners Group, which uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a Swiss run private investment firm that manages about 110 billion in capital uh, across private equity, debt, infrastructure, and real estate. Uh, and so I'm currently in uh, what they call the Rotational Analyst Program, where I do a three, one year. Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so anyways, so Rotational Program, do different you know, one-year rotations and different asset classes before deciding which one you want to specialize in. So currently I'm rotating in the Private Equity Integrated Group, which uh, basically just does any type of non-controlling private equity investment. So my team globally is about 40 of us and we deploy about 5 billion of capital a year across like usually equity checks are about like 50 to 300 million into um, deals like kind of like what Mary does, you know, investing in the primaries into other general partners uh, as well as traditional secondaries, GP led um, type continuation funds, co-investments and growth. So it's, it's a lot of different types of transactions, but it's all non controlling and I'm just going to see a lot. But anyway. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brooke. As you can tell, we've got a wonderful panel of ladies and I personally am so excited to learn from all of you. Brooke was actually hoping to hold this Women in Finance event last year. She had it all planned um, and then COVID happened. So we're thrilled that she could return and kind of see this event play out that she had originally envisioned. As we start into questions, we'd love to get to know you all just a little bit more. Um, I, I can ask each of you to kind of explain how you ended up where you're at. Maria touched on this a little bit, just how you ended up where you're at since your time at USU and maybe how you learned about or found interest in your current industry. And we'll just go in the same order, if that's okay. We'll start with Mary again. 
Sure. Um, so I, um, I actually started out school as a sociology major, um, had no intentions of being in finance. And I remember I was in a sociology class. It's called social problems. It's got to be the most depressing class in all of USU. And I was sitting there and my prof and the professor asked something like, what's the difference between a problem that gets solved and a problem that doesn't? And I, everyone was like, whether you have like a good plan or like, you know, like all these different things, like how important the problem is. And he was like, full stop, the biggest difference is like, if someone's willing to put money behind your idea, if someone cares about that problem enough to have money help solve it. And it just like clicked in my brain, like, oh, like that's, that's where everything happens, you know, like, and so that's how I got into finance. And um, it just kind of all went from there. And then as far as I never was like, I'm going to be in manager selection. It was just, I did an internship in investment banking at Goldman and hated it. I thought I'm never going back to Goldman. I just had such a terrible time. And, um, and then Paul got me to apply for an internship in asset management and I really loved it. Um, so I came back on this team and, and that's how I ended up here. Perfect. Thank you. I think Maria was next, if I remember right. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was actually, uh, or initially also, uh, not a finance major and an economics major. And uh, I remember it was like, well, having uh, one of those intro to finance uh, courses that are also part of the economics curriculum that it clicked. Uh, like uh, economics is very theory heavy and then I was like oh okay but maybe these are like the, the the instruments in which like all these economic theories find their way to come to life like in real life and after having the discussion with my advisor at the moment she's like well, why don't you do both uh, it just makes sense and and I did and I'm glad I did and I guess the the as later on the uh, like more in-depth finance courses came uh, I, I was more attracted to it because yeah the complexity of the products is just like yeah but people are brilliant like they come up with these ideas like it's something that doesn't exist but it's just a solution like if you can think of any corporation uh, like Mary was saying before you need resources to get your problem solved so for for all of our daily needs whatever they are um, that you need resources on the back of it but um, uh, after I finish um, uh, my, my uh, degree from Utah State and that was in the Full semester of 2013, so it's in a while. Uh, I, I worked for Goldman Sachs, and then actually this was more of a conscious and an informative decision, and one that was like looking to align: who am I, and what do I want to do, and what I what what do, what, what do I want to be like professionally? Um, and then for me, it was like very clear: when you work in finance, there are uh, the people that are working in front line, uh, so front office, um, the people that bring the revenue and that's the part of the return. But then there's also the, the people in the back uh, that need to know your, your product just as well, your customer just as well, your market, your, the, the company itself. And I just felt fascinated for everything uh, around the subject of risk management and compliance. Like for me, that was like, yes, this is, this is who I am. Like, it's not that we're not gonna take risk, it's just that we're gonna cover all of our bases. Uh, and then that moved me to Germany. And then I did a master's there, a master in finance with specialization in risk management. And I want to believe that somehow, uh, one way or another, that's what I'm doing today, risk management for finance. I think I was next. Um, I chose to pursue my career in finance because of personal family experiences. I had seen my grandparents run a business, but they just didn't know the finance side of running a business. And so they ended up in a lot of both personal and company debt. And then in comparison, both my parents had studied finance and accounting fields. And I saw what a blessing that was um, for not just our family, but for those around us and for the businesses that they worked with. And so I knew that I wanted to study finance and I came into Utah State and, and then I wasn't sure what was going to really fit the bill for me um, after I graduated. And so I would go to those company info sessions where back. they have different people. I'm the library. <laughs> and um, they have different people come in and talk to and explain like what the what the jobs are like. And so Zion's Bank had an info session where the banker development program manager came and talked to us. And I just remember being like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I wanted to do. I just didn't know what was gonna, what it was gonna be like. And so I started pursuing that once I had attended that info session. So 
there's my plug, attend info sessions. They are super helpful to figure out what you want to do. So I guess my motivation for science kind of went in a lot of different directions because when I initially started at school, I thought I wanted, like I knew finance was interesting, but I didn't really understand the possibilities available to me. I thought, candidly, I thought like the limit was being like a regional auditor for me and not to say that that's not a great opportunity, but it's just, I didn't really fully understand the realm of possibilities available to me. And so Paul was like, I number one fan of Paul, um, but he, I took several classes from him while I was in college and he was the one that introduced me to private equity and investment banking. Cause I honestly had no idea what any of it was until he told me about it. And so he introduced me to a lot of different people that um, he knew uh, and got, ended up getting connected up with this fund in Salt Lake City called the University Growth Fund, uh, which is kind of like a VCTE fund. And so I ended up working there for two years and just kind of fell in love with the whole world of investing because I felt like it took all the things I loved about accounting and finance of, you know, to Mary's point, like being able to prove out, um, you know, and put money behind your ideas right? and you know, being able to deal with that aspect. But I loved it because it took all the things I liked about finance, but then added on all the other things uh, I liked that were a little bit more ambiguous of like, you know, is this a good market? Is this a good business model? And even if it's a good business model, is this a good valuation for this company? And it just took a lot of those initial questions uh, and interests that I had in finance and took it a step deeper um, that really just created this opportunity to have a lot of critical thought that I can support um, and support my arguments and my thesis uh, with like my financial models that I build. So it just, it seemed like a great opportunity. Um, and then I, I don't know, I guess it probably has been canceled, right, for the last little while, but Paul does this New York finance career exploration trip. And so I went on that in 2018, and one of the companies that we visited out of New York was Partners Group, uh, which is the firm I currently work for, and found out about their analyst program and I said, this is exactly what I want to do uh, after college. And, and, you know, thankfully we got some alumni that work there that kind of helped me navigate that process. But also, yeah, plug for a big, you know, definitely agree with uh, a Peyton and on attending info sessions are doing a lot of that extracurricular uh, types of activities because they can really lead to some beneficial opportunities. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's nice to kind of hear a little bit about your background and I echo all of their plugs. I think those are so important. As you can see, not everybody starts in finance and not everybody ends in finance. Sometimes you end up somewhere else, but it's so important to Come to events like this where you can hear about different industries and different types of jobs so you can understand what you like and what you don't like and trying things is okay like mary she tried an internship and she really didn't love it and you know it's kind of some low-cost feedback you know you do something for a couple of months and you decide you don't love it and that's okay it's just a way to learn so i really appreciate you guys touching on that let's go on to our next question it is finance is often a male dominated industry and it can be intimidating when you're first starting out. So how did you find the courage to apply for a finance position and what did you learn from that experience? Do you want me to start again or? Are we yeah, that'd be great. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think for me, like the, the imposter syndrome really started in school for me with finance because I had so many finance classes where I was one of like two or three girls or, you know, and, and, or just like at events, it was me and Brooke, you know, or whatever, you know, it was just, and so, um, I remember like, there was just this extra pressure, like everything I do reflects on like women worldwide, you know, like that's how I felt. Like if I say something stupid in class, I just, I, and so I would get really easily discouraged. Um, and, and then I remember when I got my first internship at Goldman, I remember telling my peers and my male classmates saying to me like, oh, well, that's cause you're a girl, you know, like they just like, you know, they'll just hire any girl they can get. And I remember being like, I have a 4.0 GPA. Like, I don't know, like, I feel like there's maybe more reasons than that. And so that was really frustrating for me. Um, but I will say, at least in my case, like it got so much better when I started my career. One, I had so many male allies that I worked with. Paul was amazing of like coaching me through, like, you can do this. Don't feel like you're not good enough. Um, he, he was really helpful in keeping me going when I felt like I wasn't smart enough or good enough. Finance is not that hard. It just, 
feels like it is. <laughs> and then, and then I remember when I got to my first internship, I had a boss, his name is Dean and he would always pull me in and he, he would proactively ask about things. He'd say, are your male colleagues talking over you? Are they taking credit for your ideas? Are, you know, do you feel included in, you know, there was this thing called lunch with the bros, you know, and it was kind of implied that only the guys go. Um, and he was like, that's not okay. We're not going to do that. And so that was really um, helpful for me to have men who are in power step down and say, hey, like, I'm, I'm here for you. And I recognize the challenges that you go through and I'm going to speak up for you. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, Maria. Um, so I, I guess like going through, through university, I have this still very dear friend of mine who was also my roommate and she was following like the same career path. So we were pretty much in every single class together. So yeah, even in the case, I remember we were taking this um, intro to derivatives class and it was like towards the very end. And it was just like, we were the only two female uh, in the class. And I guess it, it, it always helped that she was there. Um, like I, I didn't feel alone, like it was obvious we, we were only the two there. Um, but I would say I never felt from my um, either student colleagues or from my professor, again, people I pull who supported us all the time, who came, brought to us all the opportunities possible to make sure that we were making the best of like our academic experience while being at, um, at Utah State. And later on, um, and I guess it set, it set me up for the rest of my career from where I would go after, after afterwards. But then also when I um, was at Coleman, which was uh, my very first job in finance. Um, so I had a very inclusive team, uh, a very diverse team in terms of like gender and um, ethnicities, like everything that you can think of. And I guess it made me confident enough as to um, the point that wherever I went afterwards, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, like um, got fixated in the difference or am I, I, I am the only woman in the room. It was like, okay, I am the only woman in the room and that if anything will empower me. And it happens still nowadays that it might be that <laughs> we are on team calls um, and then it might be like 15 people on the call and I am the only, it happens often, I am the only woman and I am the only one that um, is not Swiss, for example, now in the case uh, being here. And I just try to approach it as like, well, this is an opportunity for me to, to show off. Uh, and like Mary said, sometimes it's like, if I make a mistake, I make a mistake on behalf of all the women in the world. Uh, but then it gives me also motivation to do it right and do it right on behalf of all the women in the world. Um, so I guess that's, a, that's the way I see, that's the way I approach it and uh, yeah, helps me move forward. <laughs> What has always given me um, confidence and gave me confidence to pursue finance is experience. I think that nothing helps me more than moving outside my comfort zone. And even if I fail or if I succeed, whatever it is, it gives me the confidence to try something hard again the next time. Um, so like while I was doing my undergrad, I took an internship that was in New York City, moved over there. That was that was intimidating. I didn't know anybody in the state of New York or most of the eastern states. Um, so that was that was a challenge. But things like that, going and having fun and learning new things and meeting new people, that always helps me to to gain confidence. And that gave me the confidence as well to pursue hard extracurriculars at Utah State, to participate in competitions or challenges. Those things um, help a lot. And then that gave me the confidence to apply for the positions that I applied for when I was graduating school as well. I think the concept of confidence is interesting, right, when it comes to applying. Because to me, it asks this question, like, why would women feel any less confident when, I mean, you're just as smart um, as your male colleagues and your male peers in your class, right? Like, Mary and I remember, um, you know, being in classes in similar situations where I look around the room and it's like, I am just as smart, if not smarter, than all the guys in this room, right? Even if I'm like the only woman or like one of only a handful. Um, and, the, and it had nothing to do with my gender. It had more to do with my work ethic and what I was willing to put in to figure out what's going on um, with my classes and with finance. And that doesn't change in your career either, right? Like once you actually start working. Um, but I, I feel like there definitely is this confidence gap between women. The Atlantic actually had a really interesting article on it um, uh, called The Confidence Gap, I think that I would recommend you all check out. Um, but I think that idea though is, you know, 
I find women are generally less vocal and generally less willing to engage. And I think it's part of these um, differences, right? Like when I first started out of uh, this fund that I worked at when I was in college, I remember the first day I went in there, I looked around the room, there was like 25 people in there, like three women, and on a bunch of the guys' laptops, there were little stickers that said boys of the fund. And I remember looking at that, I was like, really, is this the environment that we're going to be in? Like boys of the fund, like you're pretty much the fund already, right? Like you really need to point it out more. Um, and so I think, you know, being aware of that at first really kind of, you know, it, it brings up these self doubts that are completely unjustified because when you actually compare your work quality, it's like, there's no reason why I should feel imposter syndrome, regardless of what, you know, my male colleagues' backgrounds are or, or their experience, right? But I think that lack of representation, especially when it comes to senior levels, does make a difference. And so, um, you know, to Mary's point, finding not only just like uh, mentors, both male and female, that are in positions of power that can advocate for you and who can see your potential even you know more strongly than you can and are willing to push you like i remember my my um one of my former bosses uh i've been working the fund for a couple months and he came up to me and was like you know i think you're really smart i think you're capable i want to see you lead a deal i was like well we've never had i've never seen a woman lead a deal since i've been here so and i pushed back like really hard because there's this sense of imposter syndrome this fear of like I don't, like who am i to you know do these things right um and I was, I'm so grateful for people like him or like Paul, who really pushed me to challenge my ideas about myself and what I was possible for. So I think surrounding yourself with people like that, um, as well as people, <clears throat> otherwise like having friends that you can talk to that are going through similar experiences, right? Other women who, you know, even if they aren't pursuing a career in finance or pursuing other you know, demanding types of careers, um, because they have similar experiences, right? And, you know, being able to have that support network, I think matters a ton. There's this quote I love all the time that says like, um, you know, behind every successful woman, there's a group text hyping her up. <laughs> and I, I believe that so strongly, like my my female friends and, and my male allies too have been huge contributors to my success because they helped encourage me to go after experiences that I felt were impossible or, or you know, really try to dig into that like riskier type of behavior like I don't really, or what I perceived as a risk but really wasn't that actually that, that big of a deal so I think I think people make a huge difference and, and especially that idea too of you know who do you listen to when it comes to setting um expectations of what success means to you because there are people I, I found in my life and I hope this isn't the case for everyone but there are people that I've been close to both family and friends and you know, ex-boyfriends or whatever that weren't fully supportive of me pursuing my career opportunities. And then I had, you know, have these thoughts of like, do I want that in my life? And do I need to have that kind of negativity? And you know, if these people aren't supporting me and don't understand why something's important to me and aren't willing to, you know, encourage me, especially when I need that encouragement, recognizing that it is more male-dominated industry and you're more prone to feeling, you know, insecure or like an imposter, right? Um, that had a big effect, right? So I, I think you know, surrounding yourself with the best people you can that are as supportive as possible is you know, one of the best things you can do. Oh, I loved that round of questions so much. I think that is, it's one of the most important things you can learn in school is to surround, your, surround yourself with people that support you and care about your success. And also on the flip side, being that person for other people and the other female colleagues that you are with, I think is also super important because sometimes you may feel that you have the confidence and the experience to do something, but somebody else who's too scared to go talk to a professor or to talk to a mentor about it, they may come and talk to you. So I think just remembering to be that person for others and kind of giving back as well is also super important. So thank you so much. I love that. Let's go to our next question, which is, what is the biggest challenge that you have faced in your career so far and how did you overcome that? Um, I'm okay. I'll just start unless you tell me to not and then I won't. <laughs> but uh, um, I think for me, uh, when I did my internship in investment banking um, and then I got to the end and they gave me an offer and trying to decide if I was going to take that, even though I didn't like it um, or not, was just a huge challenge for me. It felt like this is my one break 
and that like, I'm going to throw it away. It's going to be like the only time I'm ever going to do something important, you know, like, and, and it was just this like big feeling of like, what am I doing saying no to Goldman Sachs, you know, investment banking. Um, and I think what it just came down to was like you in your career, you need to trust yourself. People are going to have a lot of opinions about what you should and shouldn't do um, about like, what's the perfect path. But like, um, I think it's so important to really think about what you want. I kind of just came to this like conclusion. I was like, I worked too hard for too long in school to take a job that I hate, you know, like that just doesn't make any sense. It makes it all worthless. Um, and so, and so I had to say no to that, having nothing else lined up. Um, and I'm really glad that I did because it led me exactly where I wanted to be. Um, so yeah, that was it, but it was just a challenge. And, 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 you know, like that's the thing with finance is risk and return and they have to be educated risks. They have to be risks that make sense. Um, but sometimes you do have to take a risk. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I gave some <laughs> thought about this one. Um, and I feel like this might be a topic of its own, but I'll try to keep it brief and relevant to the topic. But of course, when I think of uh, challenges that have stood um, in the way of my career and me getting to, to places that where I may have wanted to be. I cannot ignore the fact that um, I have spent almost like half of my life being an immigrant and um, I have had to leave jobs um, where I really wanted to be just because I didn't meet criteria for applying for uh, a certain visa or an extension or a more uh, another type of status that will allow me to, to stay in the country where I was or I have been, um, I mean, not, not rejected because it didn't give me any comfort when the employer uh, or prospective employer says like, um, we really did everything we wanted to do in terms of having a lawyer there, in terms of uh, reaching out to the authorities, we, we did everything that was in our hands, um, we just cannot, or uh, being denied a position because like, well, you do have the permit to work, but um, there are certain restrictions to come to it. So this specific position, we could not keep to you. Um, and it has, um, don't get me wrong, I I'm happy where I am. Uh, it hasn't been like a straightforward or, or easy path, but, but yeah, when I reflect on it, there are many doors uh, that it it's just like the doors just close behind me and it doesn't matter, like my skills, my, my experience, my fitness um, were completely irrelevant because there was something else that I understand it's a more complex topic, but um, but yeah, it, it was there uh, preventing me from, from getting to know something or somewhere uh, where I wanted to be and where I think I would have done like a very good job. And in terms of overcoming that challenge, well, I, I guess I have made my way um, to, to still be somewhere where I want to be, where I'm happy what I'm, what, what, with what I'm doing. And uh, every time I just work harder, like I said before, um, uh, the same case with being a woman, but it also sometimes feels like I have the pressure on me of like, well, all women from Latin America or all immigrants. And that's, that's pressure that you carry on your shoulders. Um, so like, for example, in Switzerland, I don't take the luxury to being one minute late uh, for a meeting <laughs> because uh, yeah, then, then it's like, well, yeah, of course, where you come from. Um, but yeah, I try to open look at those things and then just, um, like I said before, well, just work harder because um, I, I know my work ethics and uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's it also, on, on me to take the responsibility of, well, I do my part to prove right for the people that also that I represent. The biggest challenge that I've faced since starting my career has been the pandemic. Um, since I started last June, I started virtually and have mostly worked virtually since then. And in the program that I'm in every three months, I'm moving to a new group and meeting new people and learning a new job. And so it's almost like uh, many in internships are happening. And obviously that adds an element of challenge to constantly be moving and being virtual. And so I, like, I was so nervous about it before I started, but really what I've learned is that you just have to embrace whatever life hands you. And it has, Actually, like I've loved it. I've still been able to get to know my coworkers, even virtually. I've been surprised at how um, you can still build relationships with you with the people that you work with, as long as you're willing to put in a little effort into it. And so, yeah, that's kind of my my takeaway from that challenge and the pandemic has just been to 
to embrace whatever challenge I'm given and learn from it. Just before I talk about my challenges, I think I look at this topic and this train of thought and what um, Mary, Peyton, and Maria said is that none of like their biggest challenge wasn't a question of whether or not they could do their jobs, right? It was these other external things right, that we all have to deal with. Um, and mine fits in the same category. Like, I, like, I don't feel like any of the challenges I've had has been a question of whether or not I can actually do the work that's in front of me, because um, you have resources and people available to you um, to you know, learn how to do it, right? It, like, that's not the question, which I think sometimes women are made to feel like that's the issue, right? And that's your biggest challenge, whether you can actually do it. And I, I generally don't think that's the case. Um, for me, though, like, one of my biggest challenges was honestly dealing with some of the more um, social ramifications of my career choice and some of the ways people made me feel like I had to choose between, you know, what I was most passionate about and what I wanted to do with my career um, and other things that I care about. So, you know, um, you know, like having a family or, you know, getting married or something like that, right? There, and, and I don't think this is necessarily like a thing that's exclusive to sort of, I, I think it's common in Utah, right? Um, there's definitely a little bit more of a gender norm and role expectation, like the community I grew up in, the majority of the women that I had as my role models um, were stay-at-home moms um, and, uh, or if they did work, they were um, you know, teachers or receptionists or dental hygienists or nurses or something like that, but um, it didn't really have any gender specific examples to me of you know, women who worked in finance, who worked specifically in private equity. Um, and so, it, I, I, there are definitely people in my life that made me feel like like having the other things in my life that I wanted, as well as having a career in private equity, were mutually exclusive ideas, right? Um, and one that was, I think, most difficult was, um, you know, after I'd accepted my job out here in Denver, um, I got a lot of comments from, you know, family members or, you know, some friends um, and, and some other people that are really important to me saying, like, are you sure you want to do that? Like, you really just like don't care about these other things in your life and, and really made me feel like I have to choose um, and that I, you know, I have to give up things that I, that I care about um, and that, you know, I feel like make me a better person and um, in order to have other things that, you know, don't even materially exist yet. So th I think that was like the challenge, right, is that there's definitely like this double standard and expectation towards women um, and men in finance. Um, I mean, I just think about some of my coworkers that I worked with at a previous fund where when they would tell, you know, people that they were working in private equity or they were working in investment banking, it was, you know, praised and then I would get critiqued for it or punished for it. Um, and it's the expectations like, well, how can you do that if you're gonna have a family or does this mean you don't really want to get married or do, like these other things? And it's, it's those questions that I, I think are harmful, but they lead to a lot of self-doubt um, when it comes to pursuing the, your career. But uh, I, like, I've seen so many women that I know that will opt out of careers before they even started because they're worried about um, things like that, which, you know, is hard, but it just reminds me of this, um, like, this book that I read recently. I don't know if you guys have ever read uh, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. It's a really fantastic book. I would recommend to read it if you haven't. Um, but in the book, uh, this woman, it's her memoir, and she reflects a lot on how you know, the older you get, you're going to disappoint a lot of people, right? Because everyone has different views and opinions on what you should be doing with your life. But like the last person you can disappoint and the last person you should disappoint is yourself, right? And and so just having those brutally honest conversations with yourself about like what makes you happy and what you want out of your life and then challenging some of the underlying assumptions. But by far, that was a, has been the most difficult thing I've had to deal with. Um, Thank you so much, Brooke. That was awesome. And the rest of you, I feel like the themes from that question, I love that question so much because the things that we learn from your answers um, are applicable to all aspects of life, not just career. Like you need to learn to work hard and to listen to yourself and know when you're qualified and be able to stand up for yourself. So I love those. Thank you so much. Let's go on to, this might be our last question, um, but we'll see. What, what happens when we get around. But I wanted to ask, how do you continue to seek growth opportunities in your career? And why do you believe that that's important? Um, yeah, I think this for me is related to what Brooke was talking about a lot because, um, so when I was in school, I was a sociology major too, and I had to do a capstone and I did it on women in the workplace. And I interviewed 
a, I did, I did like this big interview sample and I worked with women who were in the workplace and then who were just graduating. And like over and over again, I would interview USU students, honor students who are about to graduate. And I would say, we'd say like, what are you expecting in your career? And they would say like, well, I need something that like works with kids and with a family and I need to, you know, um, you know, I can't shoot for the moon because I've got all these other things going on. Um, and we'd be like, do you have kids? Are you married? And they'd be like, no, but I'm going to be one day. And, and I remember being like, I'm never going to like, I'm never going to do that. You know, like I'm never going to like dampen myself because of like some sort of future goal that isn't, doesn't even exist yet. And then I got into my work and four months in, I just lost so much motivation because I just kept thinking like, wow, one day I'm going to have kids and this is all going to go out the window. Like why work hard? If like, you know, like if, if, you know, is this, am I putting water in a bucket that has a hole in it at the end? And, and so I had to sit down with my boss and I was terrified to have this conversation, but I just want you guys to know, this is a conversation you can and should have. Um, and I just said, listen, like I'm, I'm having a hard time feeling motivated because I'm worried about, I'm not looking to have kids right now, but eventually I would like to. And I need you to let me know, like, this is going to work. And he said, and I was so scared, like, what do you, what he's going to say? And he was like, we're going to make it work. He's like, no matter what, like we can do flexible arrangements. Like we can do, you know, like I want you to take every bit of leave that you can, like anything, like I promise you, we will make it work. And, um, and so I just think like, that is so important for women. I think even subconsciously we dampen our ambition because we think like, why push really hard for something that, you know, feels like you're not going to ever get the fruits of. Um, but it's definitely possible. I work with women every day that do it. Um, and so I just encourage you to really, um, don't be afraid to shoot for the stars and you'll figure it out when you get there. And hopefully you find a place that nurtures you and encourages you and whatever your goals are. So in terms of finding um, opportunities, I would say keep your network. I mean, don't underestimate the value of your network and keep your network diverse. Um, I listened to the stories of um, like the three other panelists that are joining uh, me here today, and I, I've met them today for the first time. And we have all, I mean, all four, we have all in different uh, touch uh, on different points in terms of how our careers have been challenged in terms of how, I mean, the, the areas in which we're currently working. and. And I, I mean this because look how we have through the university the opportunity to reconnect today and then to be talking to the students and then you get to learn as well like uh, of all the different ways in which we were open to changes in our career to try something to, fi to find out that it failed or, or not that it failed sorry that that you didn't like it but it's okay it's good if you find out also early on that, that that's not the path that you want to follow uh, and then you continue to pursue something that will fulfill uh, your passions so I guess one thing that I have always appreciated is just like being um, keeping in touch with my network and also not keeping it just close to the people that are just in my same field or doing the same thing as I am, but just listening to everybody because you never know who is going to tell a story that all of a sudden will make you like um, will open and awaken your interest for that for that area and maybe it's just like it just takes one conversation um, getting to know one name sending one LinkedIn invitation to really opening up uh, doors and, and opportunities for you and for your future. So. I seek growth opportunities in my career by always watching to see how like what my coworkers are stressed about or what they're working on. Um, and then when they have a full workload, I raise my hand and I say, hey, do you want to teach me how to do that? And I will help you. I will work on that project. And I did that in an internship I had a couple of years ago. And I ended up doing something that was like totally not related to what I had been hired to do in the internship, but helped get the company caught up on what they were working on. And it really taught me that we do have the option to, to raise our hands and say, I'm willing to learn how to do that. And not only does that build your network, like what Maria was talking about as you um, help your coworkers, but it also allows you to learn new things and continue to grow in your career that way. Oh, Brooke, maybe it's just me, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear either. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I, yeah, my I, I don't know why Partnerscript has like this insane amount of um, well, I know I know why uh, credit information. Uh, but uh, it I don't know why Zoom always has like the worst problems by far, which is always so interesting. Uh, you know, what I was saying though was I'm always continuously surprised by how many opportunities are available to you if you just ask for them, um, and how willing people like your managers or other coworkers are willing to help you um, if you just ask because you know no one's a mind reader, right? Like, I don't know what's going to help my other coworkers the best. They don't know what's going to help me the best always. Um, and, and especially more the senior level when they've got so many other things on their mind um, unrelated to you know people's progression. Sometimes just having those conversations of what additional opportunities you want to have or, or um, you know, what you want to learn over the next few months or years or, or whatever it is can make a huge difference. And like for, for me recently, uh, there's another analyst on my team who is male. We started at the exact same time. And I noticed that he had um, been on four deals that closed and I hadn't been on any. And I went and talked to my manager about it. And I was like, hey, I recognize this is just a product of luck and with staffing to some extent. But, you know, these are, you know, what you learn at the end of the deal is very different from what you learn at the beginning of a deal. And I'm only going to see the beginning right now and I want to see the end. And so I made a point of telling my staffer and telling my managers, like these are experiences I want to have. And I don't think it's unrealistic for me to ask for them. And, and they're like, Oh yeah, that's great. Well, well noted. We'll try to like, get you on some stuff. And now I've been on three that have closed and it's, and it's been great. And you just learn a lot more. So I, I think one, just like knowing who to talk to can make a big difference and, and, you know, finding people that are, you know, not going to push back on you when you ask for certain things or, or especially if they're more reasonable but you know trying to notice other opportunities that other people are getting that you may not be getting and it, and it may not be intentional but it definitely has a difference on on your experiences at work oh, that's such great advice thank you so much